This episode is sponsored by Cosmos Ecosystem and Paraswap. Stick around to hear more about them later on this episode. All right, all right. This is the thing. What is up, everyone? I am Charlie Shrem, and you are listening and watching Untold Stories, where twice a week we get to dive deep with some of crypto's coolest people, most influential leaders, the brightest crayons in the box, the sharpest tools in the shed, to find out how this movement truly came to be and where we're going from here, because it's getting bigger by the day, getting more complex by the day, but at the same time, it's getting more fun and interesting and, and funnier. And I'm starting to like remember random stories uh, and be able to like make connections where I didn't otherwise make connections. And um, one of the things actually that I've learned to do more that I feel like we should all strive for is trusting ourselves. Uh, I used to be one of those people that never trusted my own instinct, trust myself, um, self-esteem issues and confidence issues. But uh, when you fail so many times in crypto and then you start to learn how to actually like be successful, then that starts to build up your, your self-confidence. And in fact, um, it's doubly special today um, because um, it's a two year anniversary of untold stories, uh, we're recording. I think this is like episode we're going to be recording 180 something. Um, and it's like, uh, serendipitous that I have, uh, such a, I know I call everyone my friend, but Mark Lamb, our, our guest today is, is a really, really old friend of mine. Um, someone who, uh, is considered, I consider a, a Bitcoin OG at the top echelons, someone who, uh, was running, uh, Bitcoin OTC markets back in 2013, building, literally uh, laying the pipe for the uh, uh, base level infrastructure that we have in the crypto world today, starting with his, his uh, first Bitcoin exchange, CoinFloor, and now with uh, the spinoff of that is CoinFlex. I mean, Mark Lamb, thank you. Why did it take 180 episodes to, to, for you to get on this show? I know, I think I... Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I, th I think we've known each other for almost eight years now. Um, yeah, no, it's it's a it's a real honor to be here. Um, you know, it, it's uh, I think we both kind of got into crypto way back in the day, Bit Bit Instant uh, and and Coinfloor, um, kind of both building similar times and and both you know very active in OTC, um, and and I'm sure we have. Uh, stories that we could sh share about that. But yeah, no, it's, uh, it's great to be here on the show. It's, it's, thanks for having me. And it's great to be talking about CoinFlex and DeFi and everything that's, that's been happening in crypto. It's kind of like hard for people to understand the days before we called everything crypto yeah. when we, it was Bitcoin. just Bitcoin because there was nothing else. It's like saying that like, there was a time when there was like no religions on earth. Yeah. It was like, like, or I don't know, like, I'm trying to think of like another example, but there are probably, there are probably a hundred, a few hundred people yep. left yep. in our industry that are actively in our industry who remember a time pre calling things crypto. How do you feel like, like this is, I, I really didn't even write this question down, but like when you talk to people on a daily basis, this is like you and I talking, you know, like when you, when you're going to get a cup of coffee or you're, you're like uh, with your partner and you're, you're meeting an, another couple or whatever. And you, someone asks you what you do. How do, how do you feel saying I work in crypto as opposed to like I work in Bitcoin? Well, it's it's really interesting because when you and I got in, it was it was just Bitcoin, and um, it was kind of this period where we were all on the same side. There were no, there were no tribes. It was just Bitcoiners against the dollar, and. And all the focus was on the superiority of Bitcoin to fiat. And now you have Bitcoin and crypto is now such a large market cap that there's a huge amount of focus on Bitcoin versus ETH, ETH versus Polkadot, you know, this versus that. And, and so one of the things I think we've lost is this kind of unified front of this is why you should. Bitcoin instead of dollar. And uh, we've gained a lot. I mean, there's been a huge, incredible amount of diversity. And I am I was a maximalist for many years. I'm no longer a maximalist, but I think um, the gains have outweighed the losses. But I think definitely 
Uh, there was something really special about that time where anyone who was trying to make an honest living in the space was basically part of the tribe. And, and there, was, there was very little division. Um, the only division was between uh, you know, the scammers and, and people that were honest. And I think everyone was rightfully very paranoid back in the day. But, um, but, but, but yeah, it was, it was a crazy time. It was a very different time from now. There's a, a a Bitcoin conference coming up in in Miami in June, and I bring it up because you don't see Bitcoin conferences anymore. You probably haven't seen a Bitcoin conference in years. It's all crypto blockchain related conferences, and and I think I I struggle with you at the same time because it became adversarial to be a Bitcoin maximalist. Yep. I want to figure out a way to be able to embrace Bitcoin, and then embrace crypto. But at the same time, not create like a, ma a maximalist mentality. Is there a way to do that? Is there a way to like have it where we where uh, it's like and, and I think that this conference struggles with it because oh, yeah. they want to disincentivize booths of crypto of, of altcoins and stuff. But the organizers are not anti altcoins. I mean, they've probably launched. I think the organizers launched two <laughs> projects themselves. But they want yeah. to embrace Bitcoin. So it's like embrace Bitcoin. And it's like the worst analogy. But like you look at history and it's like where you have two adversarial type of things that shouldn't be adversarial. And when you want to embrace one, the only way to do it is to put the other one down. Yeah. Is that the direction that we're going? I think that is if people think small, um, because at the end of the day, every uh, cryptocurrency that's trying to be money is trying to compete with one another. Um, so I think ETH with EIP-1559 is trying to compete with the monetary policy of Bitcoin. Bitcoin with the advent of smart BCH is trying to compete with Ethereum. Uh, at a large enough scale, everything is trying to compete with one another. Um, but at the same time, when we fight over a one to two trillion dollar pie, which is the current crypto market cap, we're fighting over, well, I guess, two trillion dollars at the time of this. We're fighting over something that's pretty small, whereas global money supply is a hundred trillion dollars. So I think there will always be people that, um, and you can call them Bitcoin maximalists, or you can call them haters of Bitcoin who are trying to promote some altcoin. Uh, but I think they're both sides of the same coin. They are trying to think small uh, and think that Bitcoin dominance should be 100% or Bitcoin dominance should be zero. And that question doesn't matter so much as the question of crypto dominance against fiat, which is at maybe 2% right now and could go to 100 or 200. You know, this, this can open up a new age where where uh, money becomes even more valuable than it's ever been before. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, we definitely can. If people think big, then we're going to have to. And I think the beauty of these bull and bear cycles is uh, the thing that will cause a bear market will be a bunch of people thinking small and not able to think big enough and not able to get beyond the, the current level from a building and a thinking and a rhetoric perspective. Um, and so, yeah, if maximalists win and if, uh, the bit and if the haters win that hate Bitcoin and want their altcoin to succeed, we won't be able to, to get to the next level and we'll have a bear market. And if everyone's trying to build, and if Ethereum is trying to replace the dollar, Bitcoin cash, but you know, uh, polka dot, you know, everything is just trying to replace the dollar and we're all trying to grow together. Uh, or 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 grow separately, but you know, not not fight against each other. Then, you know, it's just going to keep going. Someone asked me, and said, Charlie, do you think that if if you know altcoins never became a thing, like Ethereum was never launched or whatever, would Bitcoin be uh, as big as it is today? And it's a very it's a very interesting like uh, problem to like think in your head. Because I was wondering the same thing, but it goes back to competition and monopolies. Yeah. And so while you have in our industry competition, what you just described is like a healthy tug yeah. of war. You know, like 
the best way to have balance is to have counterbalance. So you have that way of like, uh, like that constant tug of war. And it's like, we walk that fine line. And I guess I always have that fear, but I guess you always have that fear when you look at something that you consider like your child or your baby. And, and you consider this your child or your baby too. Uh, really. You go back to the, to the early days of, of coin floor. Uh, oh my God. I remember, I remember when like, so coin floor was like, uh, um, the one of the first physically delivered Bitcoin. It was a, a spot exchange based in the UK. Yeah. Um, and you were, and it was like the the. I can so those early. Do you know those the early map of the internet where it's like shows like ARPANET and it shows where like it was all based in universities and there was just like five or six universities, Caltech or whatever. The early infrastructure of crypto was CoinFloor in the UK, Bit Instant in the US, Mt. Gox in Japan. Yeah and a few other small companies. And then we were all trading with yeah. each other to maintain liquidity. Yeah. We were it. Yeah. That was it. There was, very, there was very few of us. And, and it was just, and uh, there were, it was a hub and spokes model. You know, everyone just had to, you know, without Mt. Gox, we were all toast. Without each other, we were all toast, uh, you know? And, and so the liquidity had to kind of cycle round and round. And it was, it's, I mean, it's just been this, crazy ride you know from there it became something where uh a thousand flowers bloomed you're probably one of the longest ceos in the space i would say like because uh you were around i think uh, uh you're definitely around before coinbase had launched and so i don't know, like steven pair from bitpay or whatever i'm no longer doing bit instant stuff so now you're still in this like position where you're, I, I know CoinFlex is a is a is a, a spinoff of and under the parent, but you're still running this 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 large company. Uh, I mean, how has your role changed from 2013 to now? How has that role changed? How is it the same? Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of incredible because there are definitely elements where it's the same, and then. It's just completely, I mean, the, the vast majority of it has changed completely. So these days, back in the day, I think I spent way more time dealing with basically the 20, and then it became 100 players that were the biggest volume movers in the UK Bitcoin market, uh, a lot of whom were local Bitcoin brokers, and then a lot of them were payment companies, and then uh, kind of whale investors and whale traders. but. Um, and then it became out of control and I spent more time focused on product. And, and that was sort of what got me thinking about capital efficiency, um, spot versus futures, uh, BitMEX started coming onto the scene. And so I started observing that and started learning about physical settlement versus cash settlement and uh, created CoinFlex. And and so now I think that's been the common thread that towards the later part of CoinFloor, I was creating a lot of markets and, and building product. And we had, we had our own version of local Bitcoins at one point. We made a, we made a few different, uh, different types of marketplaces. And then now um, most of my time is actually building um, crypto tokenized products or, or markets um, that fit different needs. And then, you know, I'm, I'm now kind of getting back into the kind of marketing space and the promotion space and, and, and talking to people about these different products. But yeah, it's, it's been quite a journey in terms of like, just oh the God, role. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any, any crazy stories for us this morning that you were, that you were thinking about? I think there's been a few things that I, for a long time, didn't think were ever possible. And now I've realized that it's like so obvious that just makes the most sense. And so I think with coin floor and with running an exchange and an order book, you kind of build this predisposition to thinking that prop trading firms making markets algorithmically is the best way to get liquidity. And you end up thinking that um, certain things are, are the way things should be. Order books are the winning model, you know, et cetera. And with DeFi, it kind of challenged every misconception I had about the space. And, and at some point I just kind of thought, okay, I, I should just let it all go and rebuild. And so I did that. And what we realized was 
a number of things. One, which I think is probably the biggest one that's true today and going to be true in five years and 10 years and 20 years, which is that passive capital wants to do the stuff that active capital is and so is doing. And so passive capital, I consider retail, high net worth, institutional, anyone, regardless of your net worth, anyone that's basically not actively managing their trading, they're investing every day, day in, day out. And so not a high frequency trader, not a professional trader. And so I think there's passive capital and then there's active capital and passive capital. They want the same yield. They want the same thing. Active capital wants to trade basis, which is for all those who don't know, that's buying spot and selling futures and futures are usually at a premium. And so you can capture that premium. Passive capital wants to do that too. So we created FlexUSD, which kind of pays, you know, 10 to 14% annualized, sometimes as much as 80% annualized, just from the basis trade. And you tokenize it with one click with USDC, and you're into this basis trade. And it's the same thing that professional high-frequency traders are doing and, pa- and active capital are doing. But now as a passive capital guy, as an individual investor or a fund that, that isn't managing this stuff day to day, you can just one click and do it. And so we have large institutions that are minting FlexUSD and retail guys. We're so stupid, yeah. you and I. We're so, we stupid, so stupid that we didn't see this. Yeah. Because like, <laughs> here we were sitting there fucking 10 years. <laughs> we're sitting there 10 years ago and we could have developed some of this yeah. stuff. We're sitting here trying to like get money around the world. We're sitting here losing bank accounts day Every by day. day. We're wiring, you know, crazy amounts of money uh, and, 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 and moving, you know, millions of dollars worth of Bitcoin between, uh, 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 you know, OTC and then between exchanges and everything like that, just so there could be liquidity and some markets can yeah. be made. We didn't think that Bitcoin could actually be the collateralized yeah. asset in and of itself. Yeah. yeah. And, and. And what the hell? I, mean, I remember I, there was a month we moved half a billion dollars through uh, Czech Republic bank accounts, um, all pounds, almost all pounds and some and some dollars as well. And it was like, wow. And, and you know, we were one of their biggest clients as a bank. And and then they shut us down. <laughs> it was like. And, and I remember the phone call. They were terrified of shutting our accounts down because they were like, you're our biggest client. You know, the FX trades you guys do are like half of our FX divisions revenues. <laughs> like it was, it was insane. We had a big chicken and egg problem. It was a huge, yeah. We couldn't, we couldn't use the Bitcoin infrastructure yeah. to do what we wanted to do because there was not enough money in it. There wasn't. There, the, the, the pie, like you said, like we talk about $2 trillion now, it wasn't even a billion. Yeah. It wasn't even like half a billion. It was, wasn't even tens of millions. It was nothing there. You, that, that, that indicator wasn't even a thing market. Bitcoin, it wasn't, no one was looking at how much money is stored in what's the market cap of it. it we didn't, and I think, and I think that's we what didn't, Tether yeah. and USDC got around, which was they aggregated all the deposits and became meaningful enough to negotiate with the banks and not get closed down and do deals that enabled them to retain those accounts. And because they did that and they put it on the Ethereum network and they tokenized it, it solved the problem for everyone. And so I, I think as a early Bitcoiner, you know, like you and I, I think both had uh, had some experience with cryptography before we got into Bitcoin, um, and so kind of like Linux and and open source movements and and cryptographic backgrounds. And so, as someone that thinks about that, you think about a stable coin, and you think, well, this isn't exactly perfect because they have the problems of getting their bank accounts shut down as well. But what you forget is there is a scale of when you're solving the problem that every crypto exchange on earth has, you get more of a negotiating say. And, and I just, you know, as an exchange operator, I didn't think we'd ever have that say, meaning we as in my exchange, but also we as in an industry. And that's what Tether got. And then USDC got it. And then everyone got it. And now, now kind of that has been a move forward for the whole industry. Um, 
And so coin, I mean, CoinFlex is trying to basically take that concept of, oh, there's this thing everyone Crazy. wants. Why don't we tokenize it and give it to everyone? And we're trying to do it with market making. We're doing it with a basis trade. And we're trying to do it with a bunch of things. But yeah, it's it's the same base concept of there's this thing. Everyone wants to do it. Everyone wants to have access to it. Um, you take the power of the blockchain and you tokenize it. And suddenly all sorts of crazy things become possible. Hey, guys, I am Charlie Shrem from Untold Stories. And we're on set doing some crazy crypto films and movies and a lot of stuff. But I wanted to take a second to update you on the fact that Paraswap, our amazing sponsor, has launched the ability to do cross-chain transfers and all these type of smart contract transactions on Polygon and Binance Smart Chain, including Ethereum and other blockchains. So let me tell you about Paraswap really quick and why I use them. If you guys ever go on Uniswap or One Inch or Zero X or any type of decentralized exchanges and aggregators, you know that you're paying a gas transaction and you're doing it on chain for everything that you're trying to do. Well, Paraswap amalgamates everything together. So before you do, you try to do any type of cross chain transfer or decentralized trade from one coin or token to another, you predefine everything on Paraswap and their smart contracts, which are open source, do everything for you. Make sure you check them out at untoldstories.link forward slash Paraswap. That's untoldstories.link forward slash Paraswap, and make sure you stay updated on Untold Stories and all the cool cats that we're doing. If you have not already started exploring the land of Cosmos and their whole ecosystem, make sure you start checking them out now. There are so many projects and blockchains that are launching in the Cosmos ecosystem using the Tendermint SDK, including actually our sponsor, Kava Labs, are in there using their decentralized protocols. And one of my favorite things about Cosmos is the fact that all blockchains that launch in their ecosystem come with this inter-blockchain interoperability, IBC, that really allows all companies and products and individual blockchains within Cosmos to not only work together, but all out of the box interact with each other. You really need this from the start, because imagine if from the start, all blockchains can talk and work with each other in a decentralized way. Well, that's what Cosmos is doing from the get-go. Make sure you listen to uh, an awesome episode I did on here on Untold Stories with the Tendermint CEO, Peng Chong. It was really, really awesome. And I learned a lot about not only crypto and blockchains, but just life in general. Make sure you check them out at untoldstories.link forward slash cosmos. That's untoldstories.link forward slash cosmos. I've been living in a, in a largely like blockchain world because... Um, I don't have like lots of bank accounts. Yeah. Um, I don't have the ability to maintain accounts for long periods of time. I'm still paying for what, you know, what happened 10 years ago with how we all have to just constantly be opening up accounts and getting shut down. I can't walk into a bank nowadays and open up an account. It's very difficult yeah. for me. I'm like banished from check systems and a lot of early crypto people too. Um, and I know you struggle with the same issue. We're paying for that. Because in the early days, we couldn't get banking. We felt dirty. We had yeah. to like uh, uh, build these businesses and then have them be like constantly like whack-a-mole. Uh, and that infrastructure is taken for granted nowadays. It's almost taken for granted of that you can download an app, connect your bank account and buy Bitcoin or buy yeah. crypto and, or sell it in any country in the world. Anywhere. It's, it's taken advantage of what only a few years ago you couldn't do that. Yeah. Uh, you just slave, slave over that. So now we've like passed that. And now we're moving on to the next, to the next level where it's like, okay, getting in and out of crypto is easy. Uh, and now we want to use it for yeah. things. And so you've developed CoinFlex and uh, you, so you're collateralizing people's assets. And then, and then what you were saying was, is that line between passive and active income in traditional finance, it's going away. So decentralized finance is not just making it like, like being able to like decentralize finance, like banking online, borrowing, lending, saving, but that yield yeah. is also like everyone wants it now. There's no line anymore between passive and active capital. It's all the same. Yeah, absolutely. And um, it's kind of this thing where even market making 
is is normally something that's been i mean uh you know really like a top paying career like law or something like that and with uniswap really well i mean think about it like market making on exchanges is on traditional exchanges is something that you don't have a lot of people have access to and now anyone can do it with uniswap you know and it's a super naive strategy x x times y equals k but it works yes you know it It works because it's 100 percent transparent exactly so we're putting that onto our perps. We're going to create the first perp AMM where you can trade futures in an X times Y equals K way, market making in an automated fashion. You get an NFT uh, in the same way Uniswap V3 pr- provides you with an NFT. And that tracks your capital and your deposits and your liquidity. And it's all ha- it's all centralized exchange. Explain this. Yeah, Sorry. yeah go ahead. Explain this because you're because because we we I look at it layers of an onion. We went through the early layers, de- decentralized finance. A lot of people are finally grasping what that is. You can go, you can go on places like Uniswap. You can trade one asset for another. Automated market makers is just basically two pools of whatever is being traded. So if it's like Ethereum versus another token, you have two pools of that, and the software itself will always maintain a balance level 50% of pool and maintain a balance hybrid price. And that like for decades was all done by like the higher echelons of wall street power and yada, yada, yada. And, and, and those yields were large, like market makers make a shit ton of money, but that would be like active capital, but now passive capital wants all of that. And so you're launching ways to do yeah. that. And so now I'm teeing it off. Expl- explain to us what, Cause I'm like ready to invest. I'm ready to go. Let's, let's get my USDC in here. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, you've, you've set the basic foundation, the great foundation of what this is, is right now, this is something that's been done by guys in Chicago and New York and big financial centers. And what Uniswap created was a way, and, and now a bunch of DeFi exchanges have copied this as a way to do this automatically in a very simple way. So the market makers typically hedge all their positions. Uniswap and these types of de- DEXs create an AMM, which basically, if the market goes down, it's going to be buying and selling more Bitcoin or more Ethereum or more whatever. But if the market's going down, it's going to be getting longer. It's going to be buying more. And if the market goes up, it's going to be yeah. selling out. And so um, you're in this position, which derivatives traders might call short gamma, or uh, you're equivalently. Uh, selling calls or selling puts that are covered, where basically, if the price goes down, you're a dip buyer. If the price goes up, you're a rally seller. And so it's re- it's actually really great for someone that has some dollars and some Bitcoin or some dollars and some ETH and is happy to buy more and is happy to sell out of some at higher prices and at, at lower prices. And so it, it's a perfect trade. And, and, and if the market just ranges up and down and up and down, you make a ton of money from the fees and the spreads that that customers pay, and so it's it's a great strategy for those types of investors. Um, we're rolling one out, which is similar in some ways to V3 and some other projects, uh, which has buy only mode. So you, you're never selling out a Bitcoin or ETH or whatever. You're just accumulating more. It also has sell only mode and and the both mode um, and. We're creating this instead of Ethereum on a blockchain, any sort of blockchain, but instead of blockchain-based and kind of slow and inefficient, we're still tokenizing the, the liquidity you provide onto the blockchain, but all the trades are happening on a centralized order book. So you get all the efficiency of an order book and you get the tokenization of that liquidity into an NFT. And so the... the the order book versus blockchain difference is is pretty massive because the way these um, liquidity providers earn fees on Uniswap is from trade volume. So they're they're effectively betting on Uniswap having lots of volume, and the more volume, the better. It's just pure. You want as much money as much volume as possible as a market maker or a liquidity provider. Um, but the problem is on on ETH, there there are only blocks every twelve seconds. On 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 CoinFlex, you know, we have hundred thousand plus transactions a second. So 
So you can have a lot of trades on a centralized exchange that happen in the within the 12 second period that might only have a few trades happen on on Uniswap. And so that makes for a very very powerful system where you get all the benefits of democratizing access to market making and giving anyone this kind of tokenized ability to provide liquidity onto the exchange, but you also get the benefits of centralization which are much, much faster speed and also leverage. So the, the people that are trading against you are, are leveraged futures traders. And they do get that transaction finality yeah. once the block does hit. It's, it's actually, yeah, it's, it's, it's a brilliant system because it's like we want finale, settlement, settlement finality, yes. but it doesn't need to be right exactly. now for only this. So it's like, okay, I'm going to let's let's just say Charlie wants to trade with Mark. Yeah. The process of doing that is like Charlie's wallet has to get approved. Mark's wallet has to get approved on Uniswap. Then there has to be like uh, the, the, the assets need to be proven that they're there. And then there's like the actual like trades that happened, yada, yada, yada. And there's like six or seven different on chain transactions that just happen for that one exactly. thing. Whereas what you're saying is. All those can happen within one block, and then you can wait for that final for the finality once that's at, like for the for the big one. And that's what I think like PowerSwap and some of these other companies are doing too. Uh, some, uh, smart contracts are doing too. Um, it's so crazy. I guess I'm still blown away by like what the what the future is and in, and in, in how people are collateralizing these assets. Well, and the other thing that we're really excited about, and this is the first time I'm talking about it publicly, actually, but we're we're putting forth the white paper uh, in the next few days, and and we're going to be announcing this. Uh, I guess I'm announcing it here on this show, but uh, we're going to be launching for U.S. users to trade the futures. So, oh, yeah. wow! Um, right now, if, that's a huge if deal. You're a, Congratulations! Yeah. So if if you're an American right now, you can't trade on Bitmax, FTX, Binance, or really any derivatives exchange. And this is because the CFTC regulates futures trading. And um, if you're a high leveraged futures exchange, you're not able to get the license required to, uh, to do that, basically. Um, yeah. So, but there is a CFTC exemption around physically delivered futures. Uh, it's called a retail commodity exemption. Um, and it kind of traces its roots back to the days of FX and, and traditional commodities, but it, it's been interpreted uh, even as recently as a year ago, uh, to include crypto. And so we're basically falling under that exemption. The exemption is because physically delivered futures have less room for manipulation than cash settled futures. And so if you're trading on BitMEX or other futures exchanges, you can have your settlement manipulated. You can have all sorts of things happen. It's all settlement. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's all settlement settled in cash. Yeah, yeah. And so here, if you're along the contract, you can get a Bitcoin. If you're short, you know, an Ethereum or a Bitcoin contract, you can get USDC. Interesting. And it's very powerful. And so we're combining that with, um, we've talked about Uniswap and a lot of these DEXs. Many of them are US-based businesses. Uniswap certainly is. They don't do KYC on any of their users. Well, why are they able to get away with that? It's because they don't have independent control. And so with FinCEN, with the MSB registration laws, um, if you're a business that doesn't have independent control of the client assets, you're, the MSB laws uh, don't apply to you. So we're basically taking advantage of we're what we're wait say that again yeah. really I didn't yeah. know that. So if if so we're decentralizing our custody Shit. setup so that instead of withdrawals from CoinFlex being approved by CoinFlex, the whole backend system is getting duplicated hmm. into a network of nodes, and we're effectively. From the perspective of withdrawals, brilliant well, de risking. Yeah, it's way less risky for clients because right now, if you're a customer of Binance or Coinbase or one of these exchanges, they they control your funds. And even if you trust that they're not going to get hacked, you have to also trust they're not going to freeze your funds for some reason. And so, hacking a lot of these exchanges are well capitalized, they might be able to uh, cover one of those problems, but. Freezing funds happens all the time. And so what we really wanted, yeah. yeah and, and so what we really wanted was a system where users and also regulators, because one of the reasons why FinCEN has this is because 
Uh, they want to regulate businesses that have the ability to freeze funds and the ability to lose funds and the ability to, to launder funds. And so what we're doing is we're setting ourselves up in such a way, um, and this is getting rolled out soon, it's not live today, but we're setting our, ourselves up in such a way that we have no independent control over the funds users deposit. And so, again, it's this kind of network of nodes. A lot of people yeah. are going that yeah. route. Yeah. Like Shapeshift 2 did a, was no KYC, and then they launched the account system, and they launched, like, you have to do, upload your identification documents. But now Shapeshift is going away with that again, saying we're going fully decentralized again. A lot of uh, new blockchain ecosystems, federations are launching with the mainnet and where the federation of validators or whatever control everything. I mean, it's not a new concept. You look at, most people don't realize this, but actually like, like when you get banned on Facebook or Instagram, Facebook doesn't have control over that. There's a Facebook oversight board. That's, it's a separate organization that's not owned or controlled by Facebook. And Facebook did set it up because Facebook didn't want to like be involved in the decisions yeah. of who gets banned. It's de-risking. So that's where it finds their roots. Uh, I'm, I'm cool with government nowadays and everyone. And I speak to, um, you know, like I, I know a lot of my friends were are civil servants and work in various levels and I'm friends with mayors and, and judges and heads of state and everyone like that. And, and it's, it's funny to like, kind of like joke around these things, but how, how fluid and how crazy this industry has changed yeah. in the past 10 years. Well, uh, the way I think about it is if Google had to require every user to submit a passport before they could conduct a, a search uh, engine query, Google's business would have never succeeded. And the same goes for Facebook or Instagram or any of the companies that have become a uh, hundred billion or trillion dollar companies. And so, but we have regulations and we have a world that we have to comply with. And by by saying that CoinFlex is going to the US, what I don't mean is, you know, CoinFlex is going to just fl- fly in the face of regulations and ignore all these things because no, of course, because not. it's super serious and you have to comply with with regulations in every every country in the world that at least you, as in so much as you touch their customers. Um, but what I am trying to say is that CoinFlex is trying to construct itself in such a way where we have a very, very small or non-existent regulatory footprint. And so that's physically delivered futures. Um, In the case of the US, that's uh, decentralizing our custody. And and doing that for two reasons. It's not just to avoid the onus of regulatory oversight. It's also because customers don't want to trust their crypto, their stable coins, their Bitcoin, their ETH. Bitcoin Cash, they don't want to trust that in the hands of some company that might freeze their funds. You know, people, exactly, especially in the US, people are used to these futures exchanges where they find out you're American after you've been hiding with a VPN, they find out you're American and they shut your account down, giving you a few days to close out a position which you may really not want to close out because it's difficult to replicate it elsewhere because all the other exchanges won't take you either. So we just kind of think, thought about this and we thought about Uniswap. We thought about everything we'd known about the CFTC. We spoke to a lot of, you know, former commissioners and and kind of different people in that industry and lawyers and well, a ton of lawyers. And we realized, look, there is a better way. Um, crypto derivatives, in particular, are not serving the interests of uh, the global public by requiring customers to de- deposit funds with them, but also the American public. And we might be the best positioned company uh, to to do that. So, yeah. You um, I actually don't even know, like, where you're from. You know, you you're you lived in England, you lived in England all those years that we've talked. Uh, you don't have a British accent. And now you live in Asia, in Hong Kong. Do you, like, are you the first are, is our generation like that first wave of like the global citizen? Yeah. Are people, are kids going to, are kids growing up nowadays where one day a generation will just say, why do we even, what is this yeah. country that I hold this passport? I've never even been there. What is this place? I, I, uh, I, nothing would please me more. I, I mean, I grew up, I was born in Boston, grew up in LA, moved to London when I was 18. And, um, and the last few years I've been living in Hong Kong and, 
Yeah, I haven't lived in the U.S. in 10 years. Um, I have family there, but I'm not particularly loyal to that country more than any other country. You know, I love it as a place to visit, similarly to how I love uh, South of yeah. Europe or or Thailand or uh, Australia or something. You know, it's 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 a place. I I have friends all around the world and colleagues in crypto OGs and crypto investors and crypto friends all around the world and. I'm way more loyal to crypto as a community and the crypto uh, people and investors and traders and OGs than I am to a particular country or other country. And so, yeah, I, I think in one or two generations, you're going to see people that just say, I identify with this people group and that people group, or I just, I identify as human and they don't identify as uh, a citizen of a particular country or, or, or other. They, that might still be relevant, but, but maybe not even. I wonder how, how that would be. I wonder, I wonder how that could work, what the transition would be. Would it be like a country offering like, a, well, you see, I mean, we had an episode recently here, uh, um, Jennifer Marlin, who is a, a, a second, citizen, second citizenship attorney. And I mean, it seems like the world is going towards that where you can, you can uh, uh, choose your jurisdiction. Yeah. And I think when you, when you do create that monopoly, when you, when you remove that monopoly and you have countries that need to compete for citizens now, they'll have to start. Like Janet Yellen was like, well, we don't want a corporate tax rate race to the bottom and i'm like why not you know like <laughs> why can't we have countries competing for us why is that a bad thing i think um countries are at their best when and 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 nations and and that sort of thing is at their best when they are competitive and when they do feel this pressure of uh if we don't help our citizens in this way someone else will help help our citizens in a better way. And so, yeah, I think that is what's going to happen. And the powerful thing is when you can do all these things without leaving uh, your place of residence. So it's one thing to say, oh, just, just if you don't like it, go somewhere else. You know, if you don't like it here in California or New York um, or the U.S., just leave and go to England or Hong Kong. It's, I've done both of those things. It's not easy to just pick up and, and leave. And you leave a lot behind. You have to adapt to a new society. Um, I, I grew up traveling around the world uh, kind of uh, with my parents and, and their line of work. And so for me, it was easier than most. But for most people, it's, it's not. And um, I think the real innovation, the real change societally happens when you can just plug in your USDC or your Flex USD or your Bitcoin into a MetaMask. And all of a sudden you're opened up to a world where there's effectively an internet jurisdiction that is in every way just as real as a nation state jurisdiction, but it's cryptographically enforced rather than enforced in, in traditional court systems. And it's enforced through smart contracts and decentralized nodes and federated systems. Because once you have that, it's faster, it's speedier, and it's it's more effective. And it 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 it, it is also completely transnational and global from day one. So rather than a startup going and saying, "Oh, we're now open to the citizens of Germany, and we're now open to the citizens of of the Netherlands." you're instantly open to all the citizens of MetaMask, which is now a population bigger than many countries and, and certainly wealthier than a lot of countries. So that's the other thing that, How? that changes is like the amount of capital involved means that serving this yeah. country, it's like, it's, like, it's like Singapore or Liechtenstein. It's one of the highest GDP quasi nation states in the world. Um, so that becomes a powerful market in its own right. You don't have to right now to, to make money in crypto, you don't have to be buying and selling and like day trading tokens. Like what are some ways 
if someone has a thousand, you know, USDC, uh, what can they do with Flex USD? What other things can they do in the industry? Like, what's a safe type of yield? Um, yeah, I, I, uh, that you would you would say to your friends. Obviously, Flex USD is one, but I want to not just talk about myself. So, uh, Compound, I think Ave are both some of the safest things you can do with your USDC. Um, those are basically le- decentralized lending platforms uh, that also pay interest on chain. Um, you could uh, you could take it to Uniswap or any of the other DEXs and provide it as a liquidity provider. Um, you will have the risk there that you end up buying an asset, buying Bitcoin, buying ETH, buying buying Ave or 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 Wi-Fi or some sort of token. Uh, but it will probably be higher yield than just straight up lending it. Uh, and if you're long or if you're bullish on the industry, it's it's a great thing to do anyway. So um, there's so many things. Well, if you're lending, yeah. if you're like DeFi lending on Compound, for example, right? Like what's what's the risk? So like I'm looking at... Uh, the risk is basically that there's a monster liquidation of one of the borrowers on Compound. So Compound has um, uh, over-collateralized borrowers. And in fact, similarly to how CoinFlex has repo borrowers that are, that are taking out perp positions sure. and uh, perp against spot positions. And in both cases, there's over-collateralized borrowers, but they're leveraged. So they are collateralizing, let's say, ETH to borrow USDC. And they might be synthetically borrowing from you. And in the case of a liquidation where the price of ETH falls against the dollar and that borrower has to get liquidated, if Compound's markets, Compound doesn't have access to enough uh, people that are willing to buy that ETH at a high, at a price close to spot in that violently moving market cycle, um, Compound will not have enough, will not recoup enough dollars to pay back the lender. Um, I think Compound has certain things where if that happens, they will uh, take funds out of some sort of insurance fund type system. Yeah. But so far, uh, they've had many of these liquidations and, it, and it's worked very well. Um, similarly, I mean, CoinFlex has you know these types of liquidations. We survived March 13th, which was one of the most volatile periods in all of crypto's history. Um, we survived. I mean, even just the recent weekend and uh, many volatile incidences then. Yeah. So every situation will the will the yields yeah. get will the yields get worse? Like right now, you can make seven to like fourteen to twenty percent doing some of these things. I mean, even going to like a, a, a the yields are large with low risk. Like you can go to Voyager, BlockFi, who are like publicly traded audited money transmission licenses you know the whole fucking slurpy you know they got everything so you're like your risk is is your it's the same the same risk as giving money in the local credit union you can lend to them and it can give you eight to ten percent that's a pretty big yield on something like usdc uh is it because uh they can then take that money and go out and and and, and get better yield because the market is so still inefficient so over time, those yields will get smaller, like the market will balance itself out. I think there's very little leverage in crypto. Um, people are always confused whenever I tell them this, but it's the truth. Um, and that's why the yields are so high, because there's a lot of demand for leverage, but there's not a lot of willing providers. Uh, what do you mean? So, so, so if you think about equities, as an asset, um, trillions of dollars in equities, right? And about 25% of the value of the equities is borrowed against in collateralized lending. So similar to Compound or CoinFlex's repo market, um, similar type of market dynamics, right? You, someone puts a Google share, borrows dollars against it, and they're over collateralized, and they're borrowing dollars at a cheap rate. 25%. Now, now, on top of that, there's more leverage in equities in the stock market because then people take derivatives bets on equities as well. And when you add up all the OI on there, it's it's well north of kind of 50%. So so 20, let's say 25 to 50%. Well, 
in crypto, the market cap of crypto is about two trillion. Uh, the OI of all the derivatives is about twenty billion. And on top of that, let's say there's maybe another twenty billion uh, on top of that. So forty billion divided by two trillion. It's about two percent. Two versus twenty-five to fifty. So you're saying that there's like, you're saying that like, there's less two percent worth of derivatives of the actual underlying asset out there, and that's such a low risk that that's why the yields are so high. The market wants to be twenty-five percent leveraged. I think. Why? Oh, what? So, so a healthy mark. So we need more leverage. So right now we're still looking is like our industry is so still spa. Yeah. <laughs> and you need 25% of our market. So we need like, let's just say our market was, is worth 2 trillion. The, for our market to be healthy, 500 billion of that needs to be derivative of the 2 trillion. Well, I don't know what's healthy. I mean, is the equities market healthy? But that's like a normal, I, that's I a normal thing. A, I think equities are a pretty normal market. And I think yeah. crypto uh, people want to be more levered. You know, a lot of people have made a bunch of money. They bought crypto. Uh, it's gone up. They want to buy a house. They don't want to sell their crypto. Let's say you're sitting on $10 million of crypto and you want to buy a million dollar house. It's it's pretty normal to so borrow is the demand, million dollars, you know, putting up two million in, in collateral or or one point five million in collateral. The demand for leverage is huge. That's why the yields are 10, 20, 30 oh, percent. The, de the, the demand is enormous. The providers of leverage is the big differentiator. And so if you look at traditional market infrastructure, who is the provider of leverage? It's the Fed. It's the banks. It's the. It's a bunch of intermediaries, interactive brokers, a bunch of brokerage firms, a bunch of lenders, a bunch of credit firms, but they're all coming from the Federal Reserve. It all- But in crypto, it's me. Bingo. That is exactly correct. And I think that's, that is the, the thing I find most exciting about crypto is banks are now happy to provide bank accounts. They are not, for the most part, they're not happy to lend in crypto, they're not happy to open up the floodgates and let the dollars pour in in terms of lending on, a, on, on an even very safe and collateralized basis. You know, crypto is 24 7 collateral. There are very few things that are as good of a collateral mechanism. You're right. Yeah. I mean, think about a house. It takes a month to sell it. In some market conditions, it might take three months. That's not safe collateral at all. Uh, I'll take Bitcoin, ETH, BCH, Polkadot, even, even Dogecoin. We had demand. We don't have Dogecoin listed. We have the first query we got was about Dogecoin repo, i.e. someone wants to take their Doge and borrow dollars against it. And I was like, yeah, that makes perfect sense because Dogecoin trades 24-7. If, if the Doge market's falling and I've got someone who's in a Doge repo position, I can sell their Doge in an instant. A million dollars is yeah, no problem. In an instant. So. So this is a, an amazingly good market for providing leverage, but the Fed is and the banks have a policy against it right now. And my hope is that they continue having a policy for a long time, because what's happened is it democratizes the lending game. The lending is, lending is the most profitable business in the world. You know, it's the oldest business, it's the biggest yeah. business. It is what banks. It creates an efficiency. It creates efficiency. It creates transparency and efficiency in lending. But you know, lenders versus borrowers versus suppliers, and it, instead of having shady people in a, in a store, like it, it completely changes the game. Lending is an amazing business. Banks haven't gotten into it in crypto. I hope they never do, because the end result is now you have this peer to peer economy of lenders where anyone can lend against crypto collateral. You know, you can use Flex USD. If you don't want to use FlexUSD, lend, find someone who wants to borrow dollars and take their Bitcoin and give them your dollars. You know, you don't have to be an exchange to do this. That's the secret thing. Yeah, you can use Compound, you can use FlexUSD, but you can also use yourself. Like, like we're, and this is why we're, we're, we're not yeah. going, we're, we're, we think FlexUSD is going to be amazing, 
and it's going to create an enormous economy of very cheap dollars because they're also used as stable coins. And so you can trade with these dollars while you're earning interest on them. But we're not going all in on FlexUSD only because we know that this business, this peer-to-peer -peer business is peer-to-peer -peer and should be peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, so that's why we're rolling when out When can AMM. I securitize my house? When can I securitize real estate? That's the, I feel like when that, those floodgates open, when you can securitize the largest asset class in the world and make it tradable, that would really unleash the floodgates and that you'll see a real estate boom like crazy when that happens. Yeah. Well, the, the, you know, the fact of the matter is it's not, it's not, uh, conducive to being as liquid as, as crypto because you have all sorts of title disputes. Uh, every country is different. One house is not the same as another house. So um, there are all these structural reasons why crypto is just a perfect asset to collateralize against. And I think it's really funny, actually, that it's very easy in some countries, you know, the US being one, it's very easy to get a mortgage and borrow against your house, but it's very difficult to go to a bank and borrow against your crypto. It should totally be flipped. You know, it, crypto is a way better collateral yeah. than a house, but, but hey, banks want, want the thing that uh, doesn't move in price and is really slow to trade rather than the thing that moves a lot of, in price and is very easy to trade. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, if, if, if they created a process, if, if a title authority or a government created a process where house ownership yeah. could be transferred instantly. It's the same concept. You know, you can, you can, you can all of a sudden make these things tradable and then you can create all sorts of market efficiencies through it. But right now that, that is not the case. I think it's going to continue to not be the case for a long time, but who knows? Uh, I was talking to someone, a friend of mine who, um, collects physical Bitcoins. Uh, and I know you and I also like collect some Cassatius coins back in the day. There is like a huge, there is like billions of dollars worth of these things yeah. out there. And my friend wanted to ask you if you knew anyone who'd be willing to like start a business collateralizing physical Bitcoins. It's a great idea. Wow. You got to take ownership. You have, you have to like, take, like vault you have them. to vault them. You have to vault them. It's a great business model. It would I be, think. it would, it would actually be really funny for uh CoinFlex to get in that, that business. I think it's very unlikely we would, but. Uh, I constantly get asked the question because I say we've got physically delivered futures and sometimes I market as just deliverables because it's a bit easier, but people yeah. always get confused. So do I get the Bitcoin physically mailed to my lo physical location? And I'm like, no, no. Delivery yeah. is a commodities term and, and it refers to just getting the Bitcoin in your wallet, in your CoinFlix account. And they're like, oh, okay, okay, fine. That makes sense. But yeah, no, that that's a, that's a genius idea. It is It is now a asset worth billions of dollars. I had a few Cassatius coins back in the day. Um, yeah. I think I still have one or two, but, but yeah, it's, I got to go look, cause look for some of those, those early coins. I know, right. I know, I know some friends, I know um, some friends of ours who still have the, the 25 <laughs> and the 1000 physical Bitcoins. Oh yeah, my God. Yeah. I'm not sure but the 1000s have probably been peeled, but at least the 25s are still hanging around. Um, well, the, the single coins, like they trade at a yeah. premium. Yeah. So there's like a disincentivization to appeal them. And I think you'll see them in like museums down yep. the road. Um, and they trade on, on like eBay and stuff at a crazy premium. So I, I have to get my hands on one of them. But Mark Lamb, that's all the time we have today. I really want to thank you for, for taking the time and coming on my show today. Um, I think we got through a lot yeah. and we definitely taught so everyone fun. everything. Like when I'm tired after a show and I'm like, this was a lot. Yeah, like this was, this has been an amazing episode. I can't wait to release it. Thank Dude, you so thank much. Thank you, man. Thanks. This has been awesome.